Wednesday morning. Wes and I are here working today. This is our third and final bathroom down in the basement. Today we're going to lath and scratch coat this shower and get it ready to float. This bathroom gets this Zalige tide pool on the walls and shower floor. Honed black limestone on the floor mitered up over the curb. So before we start doing any lath or prep, I'm going to mess with my layout. I've got my story pole here that I used from upstairs. It works with these tiles as well. So I'm trying to figure out what our best layout is going to be <clears throat> and if there's any way we can use our mud work to work in our advantage to get a better layout. Lots of times there is, sometimes there isn't. Um, in this scenario, we can't quite get full tiles unless I mud the walls out really, really thick. And I can't do it too thick because of our plumbing uh, depth. So I can though gauge my mud to where I have almost a full tile in those corners and a full tile this way, full tiles on the niche centered with the shower head. All right, now that I've got my layout basically determined before we do anything, before we do any prep at all and get this floor dirtied up, I'm gonna mark out my square lines on the floor. So I'm basing this off the back wall and then I'm squaring out the two side walls and my line represents where I'm going to rest my level when I set my float strips. So as I'm doing mud tomorrow, I don't. it takes all the all the thinking out of it. I basically set a float strip tap it into that level line. That way I know my float strips will be set square and to the exact depth that I want. So these two side walls are going to get padded out a half an inch before we install lath to give us a thick mitered return. So this distance represents my half inch of backing, my 5 8 inch of scratch and brown mud, and my 5 8 inch of tile plus my level. That way I know exactly where to set my float strips tomorrow. Okay, so I've got a little bit of framing done. I always like to put corner blocking in if there isn't. This is just to have something to staple my lath to. Same with up here at the top. I don't like that lath flapping at the top. Basically, its only purpose is to staple my lath to. Once the mud dries, that blocking is irrelevant. The mud basically becomes its own structural unit. So I need to fur out both of these side walls a half an inch before I float because we're, going, we're doing an inch and a quarter inch thick mitered return detail. So rather than just nail some strips of half inch material on there, I have some go board scraps here. I'm gonna just screw those up. They don't have to be perfect. You can see how bad this framing is. Not worried about shimming it. It's literally there just for a backing. That'll actually also save me some mud on these two sidewalls, so I won't really need to do a thick scratch coat. I'll hang lath right over those and float the whole shower, the back wall will be lath and scratch. Okay, I've got this half inch go board installed on the two side walls. I didn't worry about shimming it or getting it flat or in plane or anything. This is literally just serving the purpose of giving us an extra half inch for these thick mitered returns. So I'm gonna lath and mud over those. It'll give us a nice solid backing for our lath. Um, I've built a lot of foam board showers over the years. I was actually doing curdy board showers before I ever learned how to do mud. Um, they have a time and a place. I don't love doing them. I don't like working over foam board. Um, I think it's a great product, has many great uses. I would just so much rather do mud if given the choice. I enjoy it more. I think I have more control with it. Um, no disrespect to foam board showers. They have their time and their place and I've done a lot of them. It's a good method. I'd just rather do mud. Now we're gonna hang lath in preparation for our scratch coat on that back wall. And here we go. Okay, I've got my six mil poly up. So the poly acts as a kind of defense to keep mud from spilling through the lath so much. Um, a lot of guys, in fact, in fact, most people probably use like aqua bar or tar paper. I like six mil poly because I can see through it. I can stretch it really tight. I can see where I'm stapling with my big one inch crown stapler. So I don't hit any pipes. Um, that's my preference. So. I also use these plaster corners. I get them at Home Depot. I like to wrap all my corners in a, in a lath and mud job. To me, it adds so much structural integrity, creates a monolithic shell that really is just free floating from the rest of the, the wood framing, which is one of the reasons they call it floating. This whole lath and mortar structure could stand on its own if all this framing was, was gone, which is never gonna happen, but that's kind of one of the reasons I love it. Super strong, monolithic, lath wrapped corners, that's the way I do it. Okay, so working with lath. 
So a lath is directional. If you rub it this way, it feels very smooth. If you rub it this way, it's very rough. The old timers would call it stroke the kitty down. So you wanna be able to stroke the kitty down. The reason is because the lath, it's hard to tell, it has these little cups. So by installing it this way, those cups are facing upward and so it holds the mud, it kind of cradles it. It'll work either way. It's just a lot easier to get the mud up there and have it hang with the cups pointing up. So cups up, stroke the kitty down. I start with the top piece. So I install the top piece. The second piece overlaps that piece. And the reason for that is when you're troweling mud up onto the lath, if this overlap was over that one, it has a tendency to catch the mud and you, you create a big bulge right there. So top first, top down, cups up, stroke the kitty down. All right, so stapling the lath. I get it situated right where I want it with a two inch overlap. Tack a staple in the corner, stretch it over, tack one in the other corner, tack each stud, and then work my way down the studs. You wanna be careful not to get a bulge in there. If you get a bulge it, or, or a really big dip, it really makes it hard. Um, you can see that's pretty stiff. A way to stiffen it up if it's still a little bit flexible, take your stapler and just angle a staple into it, stretches it. Some guys use a roofing nailer. Uh, I used a little hand tacker for a few years, that sucked. I'd so much rather go pneumatic with a big crown staple. So on these two sidewalls, I'm gonna use up some scraps. So I may have some seams in there. That's fine as long as it's got a two inch overlap. Um, on, a, on a scratch and brown wall, you've gotta always hit the studs if you have an overlap. You can't have anything just flopping loose. So I'm gonna hang those and get ready to do the scratch. Okay, we are all ready to start doing mud. We got our mud board, hog trowel, scarifier for doing the scratch coat. Got seal seal and tape around the valves. You don't want to cement those in. Lath installed with a two inch overlap everywhere. Um, I like to put these zip ties on some of these overlaps so they don't flap so much, just to hold it until the mud dries. Um, plastic everywhere to protect the walls. I like plastic on the floor so I can just roll it up when I'm done. Uh, Lots of masking tape. I like to work clean. I like to be able to be done mudding, just peel the tape and have it clean. This is our mixing station. Dynacrete Fat Mud. Water dispenser, whale tail. I got Wes, he's my mixer, what's up Wes? Wes just spent three hours moving everything I own down to the basement and cleaning up the whole house. He's a freaking great worker. Good kid. So we're gonna mix up some mud, do a scratch coat. Should take us about an hour. Go. Okay, so now we're gonna start putting mud on the wall. So hawk and trowel, obviously. Scoop some mud up, clean it up. I like to start at the top and get that out of the way first because I find that part to be the most difficult. So I'll just scoop a little bit off like that. Burn it in. And then I'll go around and do the whole top and then I'll start working my way up like that. You always want to be trawling upward. I like to have my mud board right next to me so I'm not taking a whole lot of steps. So get it up there. Move it in good. Just make it nice and even, as even as you can, get it nice and flat. You don't want to be seeing laugh through the mud. If you're seeing laugh, just put a teeny bit more on there. You want to be careful to not pile it on too thick and push too hard. You'll push that laugh and bow it in and create a big, big void that you have to fill. So anyway, we're going to do that. Go. Okay, so we're just working our way down the wall. Um, and by down, I mean I start at the top, but I still work upward. Always traveling up. I just like to start at the top and always be troweling up to my mud because my mud gives me kind of a gauge of, of how deep to go. So I like a scratch coat a lot because the mud is gonna spill through this lath and create fingers behind it and they interlock and it's super strong. I'm gonna go ahead and do a scratch over these while also. We could just float right over these tomorrow. That's called a one coat. But I really like floating over a scratch because it dries my mud out pretty quick and just firms it up nice and quick and it's just I like floating over a scratch coat better so I'm gonna scratch the whole thing okay now that I got everything coated I try to keep it super even you don't want any big 
bumps or anything, keep it as flat as you can. This is called a scarifying tool, scarifier. I'm gonna just take it and very lightly, you don't wanna hardly use any pressure, just barely scratch it. And so that creates our scratch coat. So tomorrow when we float, our new mud is gonna have a mechanical bond to that. And it's crazy strong. Um, if you've ever seen some of my, my core samples that I've cut out, the, the bond between a scratch coat and a brown coat is insane. So I'm gonna scratch this whole shower. We're gonna head down to Salt Lake and pick up some supplies and tomorrow we'll float this, so. All right, so the next morning, you can see this scratch coat is really firm, super solid. It's just after like, you know, 12 hours, it's very solid. So before I get going on floating, I like to go around and just <laughs> scrape off any chunks that are poking out a little bit too far off my scratch coat. Um, remember, you gotta set your float strips on this scratch. So anywhere you have a big chunk, it's gonna bump your float strip out that much more. I wanna keep this float as thin as I can in, on the back wall. So I just like to clean up my scratch coat really quick, chop off some dried mud from yesterday, sweep up, put my plastic back down. Then I'll cut some float strips and get set up to start floating this. This is a pretty simple float. Um, it's very short ceilings. The, the back wall is six feet, but the ceiling is short, so it's not really a difficult one. I'm not expecting it to take me more than like three hours, and then I'm hoping to uh, take off early and get some other stuff done today. So yeah, here we go. Cut some float strips. I'm also going to, to uh, tack some half inch foam board on these edges just to give me a solid edge to float up to, and then I'll peel that off. That'll give me a nice crisp corner. So here we go. Okay, I am all ready to mix up some mud and set my float strips. So if you watched my video like a month ago on floating, um, strategic float strip placement is important. You gotta think about where your straight edges are going to hit. This is a six foot edge. My wall is six and a half feet. So I'm gonna have a float strip eight or so inches in from each side so my speed can ride on that as I glide it back and forth. Which means, my float strip is going to be further in the wall than this screed will hit when I'm screeding. So I want to be sure to place the strips on this wall closer to the corner. The reason being is so each corner has at least one float strip where my straight edge is riding it up the wall. And I'll show that a little bit more here in a minute. Um, super important strategic float strip placement, which will help you get nice crisp corners, make your life easier. So. Hawk, trowel, mallet to tap in the level that taps in the float strips. Pump sprayer, sometimes I like to spray the scratch down. Not absolutely necessary if I'm doing it next day. Some people like to wait three days after they scratch to float. I absolutely don't, I hate it. It's, it's miserable, it fires off too quick. I like to float the next day. The bond is crazy strong. I've done tests on it, it's insane. Uh, don't make fun of my Johnson level. It's the only six foot level I have and this is a seven foot tall shower, so. It works good enough. Um, float strip soaker. I got these masonite strips that we ripped down. I've already cut them to length. They're soaking in the water there. Mixing station, ready to go. So if you watched my video yesterday, you know I've already got my line, my square line all around the floor. And that is exactly where I'm going to rest my level as I set my strips which means today I don't need a square, I don't need a tape measure. All I need is my level and my screeds, my mud tools. Everything's all set up to go. Takes all the thinking out of it, which makes today a really relaxing day for me, hopefully. So I'll just tap those into my line, plumb them upwards, and then my bottom and my top should all be square, plumb, and in plane. So, here we go. Okay, I swore I would never be that guy that films himself working, but times are changing. It's evolution, baby. I'm all alone up in the cabin and things are getting weird. So hopefully this is worth it. Hopefully it helps somebody who's trying to learn mud. That's my only intention here. That's it, nothing else. I just wanna teach and I think it's fun. Um, I don't like the way I look on a video. I think I look weird. So hopefully you appreciate it. I'm gonna show you how to set a float strip. So here's my masonite float strip. Here's my level, I'm gonna grab some mud. So, 
First thing I'm going to do is burn it into the wall really quick. I've already determined where I want my strip. So. Take a big scoop. Just burn in the wall. You want it keyed into that scratch coat really good. And I like to draw a little line to make sure I get it right where I want it. And I put the mud on a little thicker. Working over a scratch coat, you gotta work pretty quick. You've literally only got a few minutes. Once you get that mud on there, it's starting to firm up super fast. You don't have a lot of time to get your wood strip on there. So, okay, grab my strip, get it right where I want it, press it into that mud, make sure I can see my line on the floor, take my mallet and my level, I'm going to start with the bottom, and I'm going to tap it in until I hit my line, and then I need to plumb it up top, tap it in until it is perfectly plumb, then I take my flat shell and kind of carve the mud and burn it onto the side of that, and that locks it in place. Draw down the excess mud so it's not poking out too far. Then I'll recheck it. And it's good. That's how you set a float strip. Now I'm going to do five more and then we'll start floating. Okay, I've got all six of my float strips set. I hit my line on all of those, so I'm done with my level for the day. I don't need a square. As long as I stuck to my line and plumbed them upward, I know that my shower is square on the bottom and it's square on the top, and all four edges, corners are all plumb. Um, my mud is super thick up top on these two side walls. This one's really thick. Um, back wall isn't too bad. So you can see I rested my level right on my line there. Got it right on my line here, so I'm good to go. Now all I need for the rest of the day is my hawk and trowel and my screeds and some mud. So I'm going to start floating these two sidewalls first. The reason is, is because I don't have a float strip close enough on that big wall to ride my straight edge on. So as I'm floating these, my straight edge is gonna dig into that back wall. So I'm gonna do these first, and then when I do the back wall, my straight edge will ride on that float strip on both corners. It'll give me a nice crisp corner. So sequencing is important if you wanna keep your corners tidy and not get frustrated by digging into your mud. So I'm gonna let my strips firm up for a second, float the two sidewalls, float the back wall. Okay, so my float strips are firm enough to start working. I like to start at the top personally. I like to get the top six or eight inches in, screeded, and then I have a thickness gauge to spread up to so I know how thick to put my mud on the wall. So that's what I'm going to do. Getting the top to me has always been kind of tricky because you have to get it right against the ceiling. It's hard to just trowel upward and push it right to the lid without getting it all over the lid. So I just do repetitive little scoops with my, with my trowel. sure there's other ways to do this. This is my way. And you got to kind of figure out how to scoop the mud off your rock in different directions to get it where you want it to go. It's just something that comes with practice, muscle memory. So I don't like to 
half to three and then go back and fill in more. So sometimes I'll put the top on really thick just to make sure I get it just right. Okay, and I'll take my L screed and I'll start a few inches from the top and just very carefully carve it upward, back and forth. Just cut the mud like a little bandsaw. You don't want to just drag your screed straight up because it'll it'll start to pull the mud off the wall and create ripples. You want to always be carving it back and forth. Just like that. So my top section's done. Now as I'm troweling, I can float up to that and I know how thick to go. I go just a teeny bit thicker than that, that screeded section. I'll work my way down. I'll maybe spread two more feet, screed it, two more feet, screed it. Uh, pretty quick process really. So that's how I do it. Okay, first wall done. That literally took about 12 minutes. These little walls, I love. I love working with a three-foot screed. Um, I don't love working with a six-foot screed. I'd much rather use a fiber, but a five would put my float strips clear in here, and you just get better control the closer your float strips are to the end of your screed. So using a six with a low ceiling, that's going to be fun. So you can see I don't worry too much about this stuff around the valves. We'll carve that off later when the mud firms up and we start working with it. So just... Ride the screed up your float strips and see I'm dinging that corner, which is why I did these first. So when I do this one, I'll ride right on my strip there. Okay, so when you're working around a pipe, like a valve or whatever, you I like to just screed up to it and then you kind of got to go diagonally. And then if it was in the middle of the wall or something, you could go diagonally each way over it, kind of do an X around it. These ones that are close to the wall are kind of hard. Just be really careful as you're doing that to not let your screed um, ride past your float strip and then you ding into your mud. So, just working my way on down. I burn it into the scratch first. Kind of get a feel for how much you can get on your block at once. And then I like to get my little sides floated first. I don't know if you can even see me. Um, I like to fill those in first before I fill in the middle. Just because I feel like if I fill in the middle and then fill in those sides on each side of the flow strip, I end up digging into my middle mud. So and then I'll do another layer. Two or three thin layers. You don't want to just put one thick layer on there. Because it's harder to burn it in and thin coat tends to, uh, sorry, I'm having trouble talking while I float. <clears throat> so two or three thin coats and then I'll screed it. I don't start at the very bottom and screed. I screed about maybe eight to 12 inches at a time. Going upward. Then I'll move down. Same thing. Okay, big six or seven foot wide walls with only two float strips. Um, can be really challenging because you've got to put a lot of mud on the wall before you can start screening. So these have been one of the more frustrating things for me in learning mud is, is doing bigger walls. If it was a, a little bit bigger wall, I might split it with, split it up with another flow strip in the middle, which would make it super easy because I could just use like a three or a four foot edge. But using a six foot edge in a tight space can be kind of a pain. Uh, you've got to be mindful to not ding your sidewall with the straight edge. You also got to be got to be prepared for how you're going to get that excess mud off of your screen 
if your screen is almost as tall as your ceiling. So, I'm going to get this top part done and I'll uh, show you. Maybe this is too long of a video section for you, but I'm probably not going to edit it. So, I assume if you're watching this, you're uh, if you're still watching this, you're here because you want to learn, so hopefully you're not bored. Mud is absolutely not boring to me. I find it super therapeutic. So you kind of got to get creative sometimes. Getting your mud up into those top corners. Alright. I'd like to get a little bit more up there, but I'm just going to screen it just to show you. So, I want to be really careful not to hit my sidewalls with this. If I do, it's not the end of the world. I can touch it up. So, I get about 6-8 inches from the top. Now really carefully, I'll drop that right into my bucket. Got a bucket down there, so I don't have to try and drop it onto my board. Um, one of my goals today was to be super mindful when I'm using this six foot edge, mindful of my sidewalls so I don't mess them up. So whenever I do mud, I like to pick something specific to improve on each shower. And that was my goal for today. So. I get the majority of it carved off. You can see how my straight edge rides right up in that corner on my strips. Okay, to me that's the hardest part of the shower. Um, now that that's done, I can just cruise pretty quick. The lower part isn't really hard. It's a lot of up and down, which is a good workout if you're into working out. Um, I'm not, but I am into doing mud and hiking and stuff like that. So this is my workout routine. Sometimes on these bigger walls, I'll fill in the two sides first on either side of my float strip and carve those. Then I can just focus on the middle. So you can see how my straight edge is riding on that straight, that, that uh, float strip in the corner. It's kind of muddy, you can't see it. So as I carve this back wall, I'm also carving a nice, perfect corner right there, which is really nice. So, something to consider. Um, yeah, this is really tricky, using a, using a big, long, straight edge in a tight space, but you figure out some things and you get used to it. I literally learn a couple new things every time I float a shower, and I've floated hundreds of showers every time I still learn something. Uh, mud is just, it's awesome. The progression with it is, is so fun to me, so. I'm gonna finish this up and then uh, take a break and show you some, show you how we uh, pull the strips and touch it up. You can see I went ahead and filled in my my two corners first um, and screeded those off. That just kind of cuts down on the intensity of what I've got to do in that lower section, especially. Got those two corners all done and out of the way, and now I can just focus on the middle and finish it up. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do like I did on the sidewall, just. Do a burn coat, get a burn down for that scratch. And then I'll start about halfway up and do another coat. And I'm just going to do a little section here to show you. And then I'll do a third coat. That's right about where I want it. I'll go back and do the whole wall at once. Actually, I'm just doing this to show you. So I'll do Burn coat, another coat, third coat, usually sometimes four, sometimes five. Sometimes you can do it in one. Really just gotta get a fill for it. Then I'll rob that off and finish up. Okay, that is all floated. Um, used 10 bags. Took me about two hours and 45 minutes from the first batch. 
um, faster than I was last time. Every job, I feel like I get a little bit quicker, a little bit more efficient. That's always the goal. Just what can I do to make this work better, go smoother, uh, be cleaner, be better. Always trying to improve. When, when I first started out, you know, uh, 15 years ago doing mud, this shower would have taken me eight to 10, maybe 12 hours to get it to this point, And then a couple more hours to clean it up. So it's been a process and don't get frustrated if you're learning, if it feels like it takes forever. It's just, it takes time, you know, just like anything, it takes time to, to get good at it. And it is messy. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. Like, here's my mess. I could have cleaned it up before I showed you, but I just like to keep it real. It's messy. It's not for every job. You know, we've got a job right after this one with three big showers in a finished home. Clients live there. Um, we're going in right after the painters and we're going to use foam board because I don't want to deal with this mess. You know, I've done it. I've done those jobs where it's a upstairs master bathroom. They've got white carpet all the way through the house leading to it and, and floated it. And it's just, it's, it's so hard to just deal with all the, all the mess. And I don't, I don't really prefer to do that anymore. You know, if I can help it. So time and a place. I love it when we can, when we can't, we, uh, make do with other methods. So I'm going to tidy this up here in a bit, pull the strips, clean up the edges, just clean it all up, make it look nice, and then uh, get on with my life. Okay, so my mud has gotten firm enough that I'm ready to pull the float strips. So these masonite strips I love because they peel right out of the mud, so clean. With like redwood or cedar strips, you have to sometimes cut them out with your trowel. Masonite just, for whatever reason, just peels out so nice. Like, Super easy, leaves you a nice clean edge. So now I'm gonna fill them in and I'll take some mud, get it on my hawk and just rub it on there really smooth and thin. Just get a nice thin layer, you can see that. And then I'll take just a little dab with my trowel and just put it on there really lightly. You don't wanna push too hard onto this mud because it's still pretty soft. So I'll just barely do a little bit like that. You can also go this way if you wanna move a little faster. Um, Main, main point is just don't push into it, don't dig into it. And then I like to use a little broken piece of my Masonite float strip. This is a Rod Catwick trick that he taught me many years ago. And I'll just use that to very lightly carve that off. You can use a flat trowel if you want. Um, you, you have the risk of digging into it with metal. This just tends to glide across it really easily. So I'll just very carefully carve that. And then I'll let it firm up. So I'm gonna come around and do that to all six float strips. Let it all firm up a little while longer and then just clean up all the edges and rub it down. Okay, now I've got the float strips all filled in. I'm just gonna go and very carefully carve the mud off from around these valves. It's still a little bit wet. Maybe I, I would typically maybe wait a little bit longer, but it's good enough. I wanna get done and get out of here, so. Go around and carve that. I'll go on my edges like this and just carve those nice and straight. You can see those poked out quite a bit past my foam board, which is fine. We want a thick mitered return. The foam board is there just to give me a nice edge to stop at. So I can carve that off and tool it down and it'll be a nice 45 degree square edge. So float strips are all filled in. Uh, I don't ever wait until the next day to fill those in personally. I like to fill them in the same day so the mud dries together with the mud that's on the wall and it's all monolithic. Um, I don't think there's really a huge issue with fill them in the next day. I just would rather get it done, you know? So I'm gonna clean this all up, get done. Okay, my mud is firm enough that I feel ready to start uh, carving it, cleaning it up a little bit. So I'll take my flat trowel and just kind of clean up. I want to get rid of any, any chunks that have built up around the ceiling. I'll go the same down the corner, just super light. This mud is still pretty soft. If you, if you push hard on it, you might pull it off the wall. So just very lightly going to kind of carve off any chunks, any high spots. I'm going to go around and do that to the whole thing. And then I'm going to take my resin float. This is, if you don't have one of these, I mean, I love it. I like it better than a wood float. I use it for deck mud, fat mud, um, that's about it. But resin float, really cool tool. So this part, now if I were to wait a few more hours, I could really rub hard on it with this. 
Um, this is still pretty soft, so I want to be super careful. Just barely kind of hold this in a couple of fingers and just very, very lightly just caress it super soft like that. You don't want to push too hard. You can create ripples in your mud. Um, I'd rather have it stay flat than get it super smooth and pretty. Um, you can rub it really hard and make it look really pretty, but you're gonna, you're gonna put ripples in it unless you wait a little longer. I don't wanna wait a couple more hours to do that. So I'm gonna write it down the corners, clean that up, write it around my valves. And I mean, just super soft. Just, you're just wanting to get rid of any chunks that are on there, flatten it out a teeny bit. And then I'll do that to the whole shower. Then I'll take my flat trowel again and just, I mean, super lightly, just barely kind of touch it with that. And that's just gonna embed any grains that are on the surface there and make it really nice to put a liquid waterproofing membrane over. So I'm going to do that to the whole shower and then I'm done. So I hope you guys enjoyed my mud video. Uh, really, I just, I love mud work. I think it's such a cool part of our trade. It, to me, it's, it's, the, it's my favorite part of our trade. It really is my absolute favorite thing to do in tile. And it's, you know, you don't have to know it to be a good tile installer, but if you do know it and you, you can use it and sell it, it'll make you so versatile and you can you can get projects that other people can't get that, that don't know how to do mud. And also it's just fun. I, I enjoy the craftsmanship aspect of it. It's really gratifying and it's intriguing to me. If you don't wanna learn it, cool, don't. If you do wanna learn it, um, I hope this is helpful and reach out to me if you have any questions. Uh, mud is fun, thank you.